Question 21. A portfolio manager of a fixed income uh, portfolio has developed the below contingency table of the number of bonds within the portfolio by sector and bond rating. The relative frequency of AA rated banking bonds based on the total count is closest to. So key here is going to be relative frequency and we specifically want the AA rated banking bonds. <laughs> So we're going to be pulling in this number for sure. Got our double A banking. Um, so that's going to be our numerator, that 83. And then we're doing it based on the total count of all the bonds. Um, so we're going to basically just plug all these numbers into our calculator, and that's going to be our denominator. Uh, it ends up being 748 bonds total, um, 83 of which are those double A rated banking bonds. So that brings us to 0.111 or 11.1%, answer A. Question 22, a profit maximizing monopolist should choose an output level and price such that A, marginal revenue equals marginal cost and price exceeds average total cost. Uh, so the key here is price exceeds average total cost um, which would leave us a profit. So this is promising. This could be our answer. Um, but let's just make sure, read B and C to make sure we can rule those out. Marginal revenue is greater than marginal cost and price equals average total cost. Um, they're trying to throw you off here with marginal revenue being greater than marginal cost. Um, but the main key here is going to be that price equals average total cost. If price equals average total cost, this is going to be zero profit, so we're not making any money, meaning that this won't be the profit maximizing level. So we can cross out answer B. Uh, and then for C, marginal revenue is greater than marginal cost, so same first part as B, and price is less than average variable cost. Well, if price is less than average variable cost, we are not making a profit, so this will also not be a profit maximizing output level, so we're going to go with answer A. Question 23. Which of the following is the primary objective of most central banks? A. Controlling inflation. B. Maintaining price stability. Or C. Controlling unemployment. This one's pretty tricky because these are all central bank related. Um, the Fed is definitely always trying to control inflation and unemployment, but that keyword is going to be that primary objective, um, which will typically be, be uh, maintaining price stability. Question 24. Two hypothetical currencies, ABC and XYZ, are trading at a spot rate of 1.6 ABC over XYZ. If the interest rate in ABC and XYZ's countries are 7% and 5% respectively, the arbitrage free forward rate for ABC, XYZ is closest to 1.6, 1.5701, and 1.6304. So we'll pull in our formula here. The first thing I'll say off the bat though is we're definitely able to just get rid of uh, answer A here, 1.6. Since the interest rates are different, um, this is going to lead to some different forward rate in the future. So we can just, we can cross off uh, answer A there. But we'll pull, pull in our formula here, and I guess we can kind of see why that is here. So we're going to be multiplying that spot rate by 1 plus those interest rate, 1 plus the interest rate over the 1 plus the other interest rate. So if those interest rates were the same, then this variable would end up being 1. So we're just multiplying the spot by 1 to have the same. But in this case, we're not. Um, so we're going to end up with a forward rate that is 1.6, that spot rate of the 2. Um, and then we can see based on the formula, we're going to do the foreign over domestic. So it's pretty helpful to remember here that on the spot, we're going to have the, the lineup of how it goes should be the same. So if our spot is ABC, XYZ, um, we're going to have ABC in the top here as well, and XYZ in the bottom. 
So we've got that 1.6 for our spot rate. We're going to multiply that by uh, 1 plus 0 0.07 for that first interest rate. And then we've got 5% for that second interest rate for XYZ, 1.05. And then multiply that out, and we're going to get 1.6304. Answer C. Question 25. The time governments take to discuss, vote, and enact fiscal policies is most likely called uh, action lag, impact lag, or recognition lag. I think the most straightforward way to answer this is going to be just paying attention to um, these words and how literal <laughs> they're going to be. Um, so I think, so for action lag, I think it's going to make sense that this is probably um, our answer because if we uh, look at it here, the key word here is going to be that enact. Um, so the way I interpret it is the time the government's going to take to act um, and make impact. So that seems promising, but let's make sure we can rule out uh, B and C. So I think for B, impact lag, that's going to refer to the lag that it takes after the fiscal policy is enacted and um, the impact that it has on the issue that we're trying to solve. So we're going to cross that one out. And then C, recognition lag, um, this is going to be the time it takes for us to recognize, or the time it takes the government to actually recognize the policy or the problem. Um, so that's going to be before they start to discuss, vote, and enact. Uh, so we can rule that out too. So we're going to go with A, action lag. Question 26. If the central bag reduces the reserve requirements and increases net redemptions or purchases of treasury securities, then? So we need to consider here what these two actions by the central bank are doing. Um, so reducing the reserve requirement and increasing purchases of treasuries. So these are both going to be stimulative actions by the Fed. Um, reducing reserve requirements is basically telling banks they don't have to hold as much money for the amount of deposits they have. So they can now lend more money even without pulling in um, more deposits. And increasing those treasuries purchases is going to increase the money supply. Um, so if you think about it, somebody's already holding those treasuries that are out there in the market. So if the Fed is buying them, they are taking money out of their pocket and putting it into the pocket of whoever they purchased the treasuries from. So that's going to increase the money supply in circulation. Uh, so with that in mind, now let's take a look at these answers. Uh, a, interest rates would rise and bank lending activities would decrease. Um, you know, what we just said is that lending activity should actually increase, and these are both stimulative actions, so interest rates would be more likely to fall. Uh, so we can cross out answer A. B, banks would increase lending activities and money supply would increase. That's exactly what we just talked about. So I'm guessing we're going to go with answer B, but let's just rule out C. Um, banks would decrease acceptance of deposits, and the money supply would decrease. Money supply is going to increase, um, so we can rule out C, and we'll uh, go with answer B. Question 27. The USD GBP spot rate is... 0.6985, assuming a one-year forward rate quoted as plus 9.5 points, the one-year forward USD uh, GBP rate is closest to 0 0.6995, 0 0.6976, or 10.2. So the key here is going to be um, just understanding how much 9.5 points is. And so a point is going to be one basis point. Um, so we know a basis point is 0.01%. And so to get that to decimal from percent, percent we're going to have to divide that by another 100. Um, so we're going to have 0.0001 is going to be one basis point. So we're going to have 0 0.00095 points. And we just need to add that to our 0.695 to get that forward rate. So plug that in here, we've got uh, 0.0095 plus 
0.85. Uh, that gives us 0.69945. Uh, so we're going to round that up and get answer A. Question 28. Calculate the four firm Herfindahl Hirschman index of Tech Inc., Sun Systems, LightSea.org, and Git firms with market shares of 32%, 20%, 31%, and 17%, respectively. So for this formula, um, we're really just taking these uh, different market shares and we're going to turn them into decimals and then we're going to square them and add them up. So that ends up leaving us with 0.32 squared plus 0.2 squared plus 0.31 squared plus 0.17 squared. And we pull that in here, um, what we just mentioned, and that gives us 0.2674, answer A. Question 29. When the economy bounces back from a prolonged period of contraction, the inventory turnover ratio of most companies will most likely A. Start to increase, B. Start to decrease, or C. Remain unchanged. <clears throat> uh, so I'm just going to pull in that formula here so we can kind of visualize that. So our inventory turnover is going to be cost of goods sold over um, average inventory. So when we're coming out of a prolonged period of contraction, we're going to be at the trough. So during that contraction, a lot of times what's going to happen is, um, well, let's just walk through the whole thing. So coming into the expansion, we're going to not have a ton of inventory. Our inventory turnover should be pretty high um, because that average inventory level should be low. And so because our, our average inventory will be low because demand's high so we'll just be getting rid of our products as we're getting them and not really stocking anything up as demand starts to lower and we're getting into that peak um our cost of goods sale our cogs is going to slow a bit um, but our inventory is also going to start to stock up and so because the average inventory and the denominator is increasing um, our inventory turnover is going to be lowering so then as we go through the slowdown, um, our sales are going to be decreasing, leading this number to be lower even so, um, with our inventory levels probably not decreasing as much as the sales. And then as we start to get down into contraction, we're going to be just trying to offload that inventory um, throughout this process, however we can, whether that's through price cuts and whatnot. Um, so as we get down to that trough here, our average inventory should be pretty low. And that's kind of bringing us to where we're at here. So we've had that prolonged period of contraction. We've offloaded um, a lot of our inventory. So even though sales are low, our average inventory is going to be low. And then coming out of that trough, this is where our sales are going to start to ramp up. And our inventories it will probably stay pretty low um, just because it's going to be hard to keep up with the demand that you're getting. So increased denominator is going to and with a lower, uh, or sorry, increased numerator with a lower denominator. Um, that's going to lead this inventory turnover ratio to be higher. So we're going to go with A starts to increase. Question 30. After the 2008 financial crisis, the emergent, emerging market economies have demonstrated tremendous GDP growth. The following table contains the hypothetical GB, GDP of 10 emerging markets. Uh, we've got our table here with the countries on the left, and we've got our GDPs, and it looks like they're sorted from lowest to highest for us. Using the given data, the 60th percentile of emerging markets GDP is closest to 1.72 trillion, 2.68 trillion, or 6.6 .6 trillion. Um, given that our highest number is 3.2, the 60th percentile is going to be lower than that number, so we can automatically cross off C um, just for simplicity's sake. So if we can't find the answer, we know we can uh, take a guess between A and B. But we have our handy formulas here, so we'll find the answer right now. So first thing we're going to have to do is find the position within our group um, that falls the 60th percentile. Um, so we're going to use our formula here, n plus 1, which is going to be, uh, our n is going to be the 10 um, emerging markets. 
and then our L is going to be um, the percentile that we're doing. So we can see here we've got 10 plus 1, 11 times um, 60 over 100, so that gives us 6.6. .6. So this is where that answer would have came in, I guess, if you only did the position part and then you decided to choose 6.6 .6 trillion. But there's another step we have to take. So once we have our position, um, we are going to be using the two number, the two in order between the, that 6.6 .6 falls between. So we're going to be using the one in sixth and the one in seventh. So we go down on our chart one, two, three, four, five, six. So we're going to be using Saudi Arabia's num GDP number of 1.6 trillion and Korea's number of 1.8 trillion. So we know that the number has to fall between here. If we were pressed for time on the exam, we know it has to fall between there. We could just choose A. Um, because it does fall in there. But we'll do out the rest of the problem just to uh, make sure we understand the math. So this X6 number is going to be the number in our sixth position. So that Saudi Arabia number 1.6, you can see here we've got 1.6, and then plus 0.6 um, because we're doing 60th percentile. And then we'll take our X7 number, that Korean GDP number, plug it in here, and then get the Saudi Arabian number uh, again as well. Do out the math, and turns out we do get that 1.72 trillion number, answer A.